Hello, everyone, and welcome. My name is Angel Antonio Ruiz. I'm the Arts and Culture Director at the Center for Puerto Rican Studies. And today, believe it or not, is our last uh, event of the semester. It's been a long semester, but we've been really, really happy of all of you uh, joining all of our virtual and some in-person events. Uh, to end the semester, uh, we have these, we have put together this great uh, event about Basquiat. And, and this exhibit uh, was put together by his family, especially by his sisters, right? Um, so we wanted to do an event and talk about, you know, the, the, the Puerto Rican perspective or, or the Afro-Latino perspective on, on Basquiat. Um, and for this conversation, we're gonna have today, uh, Francis Negro Montaner, who is um, a scholar at Columbia University, also a curator and a writer and Jasmine Ramirez, who's been a long time collaboration, uh, collaborator at Centro, uh, as a research assistant some, some time ago. Uh, and it's right now like an independent curator and have done amazing job with different museums, including the Museo del Barrio and Brooks Museum. So uh, I'm gonna leave you with Frances and with Jasmine. Thank you and welcome to be, uh, welcome here. Thank you so much. Buenas tardes. You see, um, do you hear me? Yes? Okay. So um, I also want to say that I'm a longtime collaborator with Francis Negron, and together we wrote an, uh, a, um, we, we co wrote an essay about Jean Michel Basquiat. Um, wow. Francis, can you give the title quickly as I just slipped my mind? Well, King of, King of the Line. The line. And, right. I, and I'll, I'll talk a little bit about our approach there, theoretical approach there a little later. Okay, so just quickly, um, I was privileged to have known Jean-Michel Basquiat um, and uh, when I was coming up in the art world. And so this exhibition uh, was amazing uh, for me. Now we titled, we actually retitled this, ex, this uh, our talk uh, through a decolonial lens, not through an Afro-Boricua lens, because I think ultimately uh, Jean-Michel's work really um, speaks to um, issues of decolonial aesthetics. And what do we mean by that? Or what is through a decolonial lens? Well, for me, it's really keeping in mind what the legacy of colonialism, capitalism, and slavery have had on um, any time I look at works of art could be a Picasso, I'm still thinking about that. Um, not using art as an escape from history, but as a meditation on it, having a critical perspective when I'm looking at culture. And in terms of artists of color, in, in particular, what I'm looking for is a consciousness, you know, is there a conscious, how do they address these legacies in their artwork? And what I wanna say about this exhibition, uh, King Pleasure, is that the sisters, um, the, exec the, the executors of Jean Michel's estate now, have done a remarkable job of creating an exhibition that decolonizes Jean Michel Basquiat from what I think is, you know, our, our, is, is this uh, trope of the tragic Negro artist um, alienated and exploited by a white supremacist art world and replaces it with this notion of Black joy, of family of healing and of connection. Now, somewhere in between is the truth, but in terms of what the sisters have done, which is to reclaim the, you know, the brother that they knew, it is a, um, an exhibition that really um, gets to your heart and to your senses, but it is an unconventional exhibition in terms of how one usually goes to a museum and works are, are basically presented out of context. You know, and that could also be another part of that, the decolonial quality of this exhibition is that it doesn't alienate Jean Michel's art from his being and from his family and from the world. So let me just give you a basic run through of what I mean. Let me share my screen. Share. And the first thing that greets you uh, when you go into the exhibition is this shot of Jean-Michel in Maui. He, you know, I mean, he radiates this idea of King Pleasure and, and Joy. This is not the Jean-Michel I have to 
I was able to, to know as well as other aspects of his personality, the more daring and um, you know, the, the artist about the downtown New York scene, but it definitely gives you an impression of the best, the very, very best that Jean could be, the brother that they loved. And the exhibition really begins with his birth and um, a, uh, this, this is uh, his self-portrait from 1960. He was born um, December 22nd, 1960. And next to it is this genealogy that he created of his family. And here you're going to see, um, you know, right away they make that, 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 that declaration that Jean remembered his family in his art, that his family was, his family was always embedded in his artistic output. And so the, um, we have uh, Abuelita, his mother, his father, references to his sister, um, and also a beautiful rendering of um, of his mom, or a, or you could think about it as a Madonna and child. And I'd like to, everyone to always remember that Jean Michel loved his mother very much. That's also represented in the catalog, though not necessarily in the artwork in 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 the exhibition. The importance of his mother to his artistic production, but um, certainly this um, this drawing here, um, and any mother uh, for anyone who knew Jean Michel. Um, very much reflects the love that he had for his mom and, and what she gave him, which he said specifically, the art came from her. Um, then that's followed by some wonderful portraits of Warhol of the family, that's of his sister, Lisanne, uh, Lisette I, uh, and his mother, Matilde, and his father, Gerard. Uh, maps of where he hung out in Brooklyn and beautiful photographs of Jean in places that I also recognize in Prospect Park, uh, Brooklyn Museum, um, at the beach, uh, their family homes. And speaking of family homes, a fan, you know, a, a wonderful recreation of his actual uh, living room and dining room in which, again, what you want to see represented, think about how usual black and Latino families are represented by the media at that time. And here you see the exact opposite, a home that is orderly, that has books, the World Book Encyclopedia, which by the way, I also had, which many, you know, working class and, 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 and middle class uh, families with aspirations for their children, they had the encyclopedias in their home and music was always playing and it's just beautifully presented. And then there's a recreation of Jean-Michel's studio on Great Jones Street, replete with um, a uh, trench coat, a raincoat that I personally remember him wearing all the time. It was kind of his signature style. Um, it has the uh, cast off quality that when you went into a studio, you saw uh, record, records playing, paint on the floor, and just, you know, obviously it's, 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 missing, it's missing the people and the excitement, but you get the sense that Jean was always at work and at play at the same time. And then I think the heart of what makes this exhibition so important is a section really dedicated to examining Jean Michel's um, addressing his relationship to white supremacy, racism, sexism. Um, it's a wonderful part of an exhibition. It gives you that critical perspective that Jean was very much aware of his positionality as a black man in America in, in you know in, in the world and how that affected his subjectivity and then finally um, a section that I personally loved it's very small but um, they did include works of art that reference the old masters that Jean Michel you know, that Jean Michel also admired uh, here the death of Marat by David and women drawing um, her neck is probably by Edgar Degas. Um, so when John would go off to uh, see museums, I mean, you know, if, if, if you read tabloids, all he did was get high, um, but that's not true. He also visited museums and he cared very, very deeply about, about the history of art and works of art and looked at old masters. And so this makes reference to, you know, Jean, Jean Michel's ambitions to be part of a, the great canon of world art history. And then finally, you've got the superstar, uh, Jean Michel, uh, the mural that he created for the nightclub, the Palladium. 
And the best part, or one of the best parts, is a really swank um, store where you can buy lots of great Jean-Michel gear. I got myself the, you know, an iWatch uh, uh, band and a hat and, you know, two, two catalogs. You could easily spend $200, but well worth it. Um, criticisms of the show. Uh, overall, excellent show. Suggest everyone go see it with this lens of how they are portraying and re-portraying and reclaiming their brother as a whole human being and not as a trope. Um, but um, what's missing, I think, is a discussion of the artists of color, emerging artists of color, of which I was a part of. Um, in New York that also sustained him and that you know was a second family to him. Um, I'm thinking particularly that it completely excludes discussions of his collaboration with Al Diaz because before Jean-Michel you know, broke into the high art world, he was known in the street art world as Samo. And that was, uh, and that was a joint project with Al Diaz. And, um, and even in a painting that is in the exhibition, um, here uh, is one of his masterpieces, uh, Hollywood Africans in front of the Chinese theater of movie stars. And it depicts him, it's a self-portrait of Jean-Michel here with Ram Al Z and Toxic. And, and these are both, you know, legendary, legendary you know, aerosol artists, but Ram Al Z above all was act actually had his own following and was considered just as important as uh, Jean-Michel, if not more than important than Jean-Michel because he had written a manifesto uh, that was published in, um, the, um, in Art Forum around 1982 called Iconoclastic Panzerism in which he actually discussed his theory of the importance of graffiti art and how artists in New York, largely artists of color, were remaking the alphabet in their own style and hiding mystical languages, how they were really um, at war with normative standards of thinking through refiguring the alphabet. That's a little synopsis. I hope that some of you go and check out who Ram Z was, master, master artist. Um, so, that was my you know, criticism of, of the exhibition from a perspective of, of an art historian. And um, Francis is gonna discuss other issues within the exhibition that we both wanna want to reclaim among them his Boricua identity, but I'm gonna leave that to my colleague Francis. Thank you. Thanks so much. Are you sharing your screen, Francis? Yeah, I think you need to. Uh, okay, I'm trying. Okay, I'm gonna go here. Um, oh, look, I did it. I think I'm there too. Yep, estamos. All right. Well, thank you so much for that. That was uh, a great introduction. Uh, I'm going to um, zone uh, zoom into a few elements of the exhibit and open up some questions. Um, I think one of the first things that struck me about the exhibit and the catalog was the uh, multiple ways that the curators tried to explain what they were trying to do. Uh, and I think that's meaningful because uh, there seems to be a little bit of pressure on the curators. So I wanna just make a few references to that. So in the, in the catalog, uh, Lisanne um, mentions that, that this exhibit was from the perspective of the family because I quote, we're the only ones that can really provide insight into his journey and the context uh, which we, he was raised and the way he entered into adulthood. Um, Lisanne also says uh, in another moment in the catalog uh, that this is in a way the fulfillment of the mother's wish uh, after he died, uh, Matilde uh, Basquiat um, started a, um, a memories um, book for people to write in uh, what they remember about Basquiat uh, as a way to make sure that that memory lived on. Uh, and the third uh, instance, uh, Lisan uh, speaks to that this exhibit is about sharing an intimate and personal view on our brother Jean-Michel's life that only we as his family can share. And this um, 
articulation of what the exhibit is about seems to be consistent with the very um, title of the exhibit, Kim Pleasure, which references uh, a piece by Basquiat called exactly that, Kim Pleasure. Uh, and there's been you know, multiple perspectives on what this text this is about. Um, but if we take it pretty much at face value and uh, think about King Pleasure, the singer, which might be one of these reference, the reference here, our most overt reference, was a jazz vocalist uh, who was one of the early masters of vocalese, which is a, a way that a singer sings words to a well-known instrumental solo. Then you can see the curators kind of doing that, uh, executing a vocalese. They are adding their words to uh, Basquiat as the instrumental solo, not silent certainly because his works uh, uh, speak uh, for, uh, in, in multiple ways, but that this is part of what they're trying to do. And the emphasis on pleasure or, or the choice of pleasure, King Pleasure as a um, unifying rubric is precisely meant to what uh, Jasmine was talking about to make sure or to critique and reject the narrative that Jean-Michel Basquiat's life was entirely sad, depressed, and tragic, uh, which fits into these uh, larger stereotypes about um, you know, Black and other people of color, women, uh, artists, um, and so forth. So she, she talks about in the catalog that this exhibit was in many ways to underscore the ways that Basquiat loved, I quote, loved, fun, and pleasure. Before I go into some of the things that I found uh, complicated about it, uh, I just wanna mention some of the things that I, uh, I found a bit different that, that weren't in other exhibits that I have seen in the past. One of them was the references to the multiplicity of um, sources of Basquiat and the catalog actually has a, a sequence where uh, they do a sort of bibliography of some of the things that Basquiat read. And I think this is very important uh, because in the work that uh, Jasmine and I have done um, about Basquiat's work, one of the things that we propose uh, um, and as an argument is that Basquiat is not only a painter, but also a writer. Uh, and I would go further and say a decolonial thinker. Um, so in a way, the, the rubric of, of the, or the uh, category of painter seems to be extraordinarily narrow uh, to encompass the capacity of Basquiat. Uh, and what is he, what is what he's doing with the work? So to have this catalog of, of uh, materials that are uh, not only music, because some people have already spoken about music and the importance and the value of it to work, but to talk about books and he, and the the influences he derived from those sources, I think it's an important contribution to thinking about Basquiat, and and it's particularly important when we uh, see the uh, many works that are present in the exhibit that feature writing. Uh, and one of the things that in our piece, uh, King of the Line, we discuss it, is how exactly this decolonial thought works in, in Basquiat, or at least one way that we think it works. And, and that way is that he is, uh, he relates in a nonlinear way, uh, different kinds of texts, you know? So, whereas uh, in a, I think a traditional academic or scholarly work, you would have a kind of linear argument, more or less. Uh, I mean, it's founded in pages or in a book. Uh, in, in Basquiat, you often have uh, multiple references to historical, aesthetic, and other dimensions of life, and various ways that these elements could be related, which is, I think, one of the ways that he, he is so rich and exciting as a thinker. He is not telling you a definitive uh, argument. He's not uh, trying to give you a definitive answer to the questions that he raises, but actually provides a kind of roadmap uh, for people to uh, you know, engage, uh, get inside uh, and do the work of relationality. And in that sense, uh, it reminds us of Glissant's method of uh, poetics of relation. Um, another thing that I found interesting in this uh, exhibit is that there are a number of pieces uh, that uh, showcase female figures, which is not uh, in, in most exhibits or in all of the prior exhibits that I've ever seen, uh, there's very, very few. I mean, uh, Jasmine mentioned Abuelita, which is uh, one of my all time favorites, uh, and that is uh, included in a number of exhibits. But in this one, there were a number of uh, works that had the female body in some in ways that I had not seen it before. And I think that opens some questions for, uh, for later that we can discuss. 
Of course, uh, any mother that Jasmine brought up is interesting um, in that sense because it does mention mother, uh, which is also not uh, that common in the work. Uh, I, discursively, in the ways that Basquiat talked about his family and, and Matilde, uh, he often did talk about her uh, as very central to his life. Um, so before I get into Matilde, um, I wanna say that that setup that the um, curators uh, put forth seems to have a little bit of a haunting, like there's some, it, it felt to me in the text and in the videos that are, were part of the exhibit, there was a kind of uh, concern that the curators had. And I, I seemed like there were two kinds of concerns. In the exhibit, in the videos, there was a lot of mention from interviewees or participants in the videos, uh, apart from the sisters, but also other people that they included, that there was a concern that the family was uh, profiting from the work of Basquiat, that their main motivation was profit. Um, and in the catalog, that concern is much less, it's not really even mentioned. Uh, what is mentioned is the, uh, the sense that scholars and others uh, d uh, are imposing ideas uh, about Basquiat. So if I were to identify the two counter uh, um, discourses or, or elements that, that the curators seem to be negotiating with, one is the charges that they are somehow profiting and that is their main motivation to uh, manage the estate. And the other one is that uh, scholars and others uh, are, are you know, inquiring into Basquiat in the wrong way. And there is a direct address about this in page 293 of the catalog uh, where um, it said the heavy work is not what is entailing caring for the John michel estate. It is responding to the ways that people want to own his voice. I think it's beautiful that so many people want to get into his head. They want to know what he had to say. They want to hear him. At times they filter through their own perspectives which sometimes distort his voice. We are in the position to paint them back to the words he set down on paper and canvas. So there is a, um, an attempt through this various discursive means to say that the family's perspective and the family as a unitary, uh, as, a, as a unit, the family's perspective is uh, the one that knows about Jean-Michel and other people may not know. Which then leads me to the ways that Mathilde uh, uh, Basquiat was included or not included uh, in the catalog and in the exhibit. And, and I have to say, this is, was really the main reason I went to the exhibit because I am writing about um, Basquiat and I'm writing about the maternal context. So I was very interested in seeing how the exhibit uh, represented or, or managed this part. And in the exhibit itself, uh, Matilde is, is very rarely seen. Um, in the catalog, uh, and in fact, this image that I have up right now that also Jasmine uh, mentioned is not by Basquiat, right? It's, it's by Andy Warhol. Um, so the, the main uh, image uh, or the most substantial, the, the, the image that takes the most space is not by Basquiat or of the Basquiat family, but by Warhol. Uh, it is uh, about 1986 piece and it's based on a series of photo of Polaroids uh, as the one seen on the right. So in the exhibit, I would say that Matilde uh, is an enigma, uh, uh, not a total absence, but certainly we don't know much about her. Uh, uh, but related to that, there's more mentions about Nora Fitzpatrick, the stepmother of the, um, of the Basquiat children, um, which uh, is what the curators uh, normally refer to as the family. It's the sisters, and the stepmother, uh, Gerard Basquiat and Mathilde Basquiat both have passed away. But it is interesting and, and significant, I think, that that is what we the family means. In the catalog, uh, the main uh, traumatic experience or, or, the, or the experience that gets the most attention is the divorce between uh, Basquiat's parents. Uh, and uh, there are some uh, references to the background of Mathilde Basquiat, uh, her, her parents, how they met, uh, how they travel, or not very much detail, but some uh, references to how they got to, the, uh, to New York. But I would say that even in the catalog where it has substantially more information than the exhibit, we don't really get to know uh, very much about Matilde Basquiat. Although as Jasmine mentioned, uh, Basquiat in more than one occasion said 
uh, the art came from her, which seems to be a pretty substantial claim to make for someone that, we, uh, that we're not getting to know uh, uh, much, if at all. I found that uh, the ways that Matilde is are not represented to be also tied to the ways uh, that Puerto Rico is not represented. And, and before, or, or the way that, that the Puerto Rican connection is uh, um, represented to some extent, but minimally. Uh, and before going to that, I wanna say that uh, although in the exhibit, Puerto Rico is pretty much uh, referenced, I would say negatively, fundamentally, and in the catalog with banality, uh, he, Basquiat himself took Puerto Rico pretty seriously in a number of works. Uh, so for instance, this is 50 Cent, um, which is uh, one of the, um, to me, one of the most interesting works of the, Bas of the decolonial Basquiat canon, uh, whereas, uh, I mean, it would take us a very long time to uh, even get to start a read on this, but I want to call attention to uh, that this uh, piece uh, attempts to relate and explore multiple instances of U.S. colonial intervention, whether directly, uh, as in the case of Puerto Rico, or as a neocolonial power in the region, uh, in various uh, Caribbean spaces, Jamaica, Haiti, and Puerto Rico. It, it's uh, relevant and significant that most commentary about this piece uh, focuses on Jamaica and Haiti, and very few even mention Puerto Rico as part of this exploration. And I want to highlight just two small parts of this text uh, to see that, uh, that indeed uh, Puerto Rico is part of this meditation and exploration. If you look at the uh, my left, it says back to Africa, back to Africa, which in the context of this piece clearly refers to Garvey, um, about seat uh, Jamaica, but it, below that you have Operation Bootstrap. And Operation Bootstrap is contextualized within this larger uh, history of US interventions in the Caribbean that is as significant to mention as uh, to San Louverture, which is in the bottom, or Garvey at the top. And if you look at the right, uh, you see uh, what appears to be the name was Luis Munoz Rivera. Um, I wondered if uh, this was an indirect reference to Luis Munoz Marin rather than a, a, a direct engagement with Luis Munoz Rivera, given Luis Munoz Marin's uh, major role uh, in the uh, designing of the diaspora uh, of expulsion of Puerto Ricans from the island to the United States. Uh, but in any event, uh, Puerto Rico itself in the exhibit, uh, there's uh, the main mention is in the video. Again, I think the videos are very important to think about the exhibit, not only what is shown on the walls, because the videos are the most direct appeal by the curators uh, to uh, establish their perspective and the, what they consider valuable and important. And in that, in that instance, in the video, the main reference to Puerto Rico is as the site where they experience racism which of course is, would be very relevant to discuss what, what were the circumstances, what was the concept, what happened. However, we don't get told that at all. Uh, we just get told that there was something uh, that where there was some set of circumstances where Jean-Michel Basquiat experienced uh, racism uh, in Puerto Rico and that was very difficult. Um, in the catalog, this particular uh, story is not included. Uh, what is included is that uh, one day when uh, they lived in Puerto Rico, and by the way, they lived in Puerto Rico for two years when Gerard was transferred there for work, um, that they put soap on the hallway of their apartment in Miramar and that they skated, uh, uh, you know, they uh, figure skated on the soap um, and that it was in Puerto Rico. Uh, and I think this is uh, very important, uh, although not explored, that it was in Puerto Rico where Don Michel first uh, started being exposed to photography which is a whole uh, uh, area of his work that has not gotten any or much attention. So I think uh, the, the ways that Matilde is, is, is and is not included, the ways that the Andrades family at large is minimally included, uh, and the ways that Puerto Rico uh, is also in, either inconsequential, rather inconsequential, or the site of, of negative experiences uh, form a sort of pattern, I feel, uh, in the exhibit and in the catalog uh, which is a question. I mean, I don't now have the answer why this is the case, uh, but certainly something noticeable. And uh, uh, to finish, I just wanna leave us with this, um, this piece that um, uh, Jasmine also highlighted, 
uh, because apart from being a genealogy, which it is, uh, it has multiple, uh, and also a genealogy that, that um, suggests multiple relationships between the members. So it's not, not only a linear genealogy, if we came from here, but that there's all these relationships between members of the family. Uh, this was one of the most revealing pieces for what I'm working on right now. Uh, and I'll just say that to me, this piece was an archive, a mystery and a memory. Uh, and that uh, I will be writing some more in the future about this little piece of it right down there on the right, which says bongos in the basement. So I leave you with that. Uh, thank you so much. Thank you, Francis. That was, that was good teamwork as always, you know? Yeah. Uh, <laughs> so let's, uh, let's unpack a little bit more of, uh, I know that you're writing about Matilde right now. Um, is there anything that you want to add um, about that research? Not yet. Not, not yet. Then um, how about, well, how do you feel then about our work in relationship to the fact that we didn't address the issue of anti-Blackness among Latin Americans. In other words, if we were to rewrite our essay today, would we, would you figure that in? I mean, I feel like one of the things that the exhibit did, uh, did raise, I mean, at the, at, on the one hand, it is significant that giving the importance of Puerto Rico and Puerto Ricans to this family, that, and given that this family was raised in the US at the, at the time that they did, um, it is, it is interesting that the, ma the main uh, mention of Puerto Rico is as a site of anti-racism and not, you know, at the same time, if I had uh, known that before, um, I would have definitely wanted to explore that further and try to understand what happened and, and how experiences of, of racism within Latino communities, within Puerto Rican communities could have shaped uh, Basquiat's uh, decolonial perspective. Uh, which is what we didn't we didn't know. Uh, Basquiat in his work that uh, certainly, I mean, in retrospect, we can see that uh, there are certainly instances where he points to racism using racist uh, Spanish phrases. Mm -hmm. So, for instance, pelo malo, which has various appearances in his work. So there was actually it was actually there. Uh, but we didn't, uh, we didn't proceed, we didn't uh, explore it at the time. Uh, I guess we were more interested, I mean, I, th I think that the two goals of that piece were, uh, how is it that Basquiat is a thinker uh, and a writer and, and what is his method? Um, and, uh, and we focused on these uh, pieces that were pretty global in scope um, to inquire, but definitely if I was going to, um, rewrite or reconsider or in the next piece that I'm writing, I'm certainly going to be uh, inquiring deeper into that. Well, um, what, what I did, I wrote a piece or I presented a piece at, at a conference called uh, Basquiat Still Fly at 55. And um, one of the things I want you to consider is, uh, about um, his first, you know, his, his first collaboration, which was with a Puerto Rican artist, right, with Al Diaz, mm -hmm. and that they called it um, Samo. But mm -hmm. for me, because with a, with a lot, you know, Jean-Michel, like New Yorican, uh, you know, poets, they play around with language and uh, uh, things that sound alike. I always heard it as Sambo, sats, sure. it was Samo, but also Sambo. And Sambo is a term that is still, it, it's, a, it's an ethnic, it, it's a racial term an ethno-racial term that I think back in our day was still used on the island. And when, and that is the progeny of an African and a Indian woman, you know, which is what a lot of us kind of are, you know, the majority of us are, you know, that black Indian, some Spanish. And um, so I thought about how in Puerto Rico and he, being really a person exposed to three languages at once, how that has always affected his consciousness of himself, you know, within world history. Um, and, but that playfulness with language, I think is very much due to being in New York during, a, during the time of the New Yorican movement, 
when there's a lot of these language um, uh, practices going on downtown on the Lower East Side, which is where the which is where um, he wrote a lot of his poetry is a downtown area. So that was teeming with uh, poetic life by Puerto Ricans and African Americans at that time. Um, another thing I would say about his mom and, and something that I would, I would emphasize, um, I, I would look at today is that one of the things that brought us together and in this, in this respect, I'm answering um, uh, one of, uh, a question that's in the chat about my specific relationship um, to Jean-Michel and the downtown scene in the late eight, in the late seventies, early eighties. Um, one of the things that brought us together, I think, um, just intuitively is that we both had Afro Boricua mothers who were really creative and wanted to, and were aspiring artists, but you know, the forces of the world conspired against them. And so they put a lot of that energy into us. And so, you know, they took us to museums. I mean, think about it. You, you, you don't think Puerto Ricans, Puerto Rican afro boricua mothers are taking their kids to the Brooklyn Museum or to the Met or something in 1965. But yes, they were taking us there. And that's something that we instinctively knew about each other and what brought us together was the fact that, you know, we both had these artistic moms that also were really unhappy, you know, were unfulfilled and, and suffered, you know, different issues. And it's that that drove us, I think, to the art world. Um, you know, we were outsiders. We didn't fit into regular high schools. I fit into a, many high schools, but they rejected. They, in fact, told my mother I couldn't go to a specialized high school. And so, you know, the streets in New York City at that time, it drove, it drove not, schools were very disillusioning. Our mothers, may have had you know these aspirations but maybe they didn't know how to work the system as well and so for whatever reason and also maybe issues with our moms you know our moms are both at, when you're an adolescent you love your mom but you also run away from her you know so all these issues brought us to the nightclub scene um, with these aspirations um the sense of belonging um at home that you couldn't necessarily express in nightclubs at the time you know you've you're, you're young, you, you wanna get away from home. And so you're making your own family with new friends. Um, and so it is, a, it is a time when you're, you're, you're still separate. I mean, most, kid, most kids in their twenties, somehow or another, they begin that separation with their parents. So it's what drove us together. But at that time, maybe John couldn't acknowledge it as much. Maybe uh, today he would yeah. process it differently. I mean, two, two quick things. One is uh, when I teach uh, uh, Basquiat's writing as poet, uh, poetics uh, in class, um, I often contextualize it in the New York movement. And we did that too in our piece. Uh, and I use a piece called Fuego Flores uh, because it is um, to me a very meta piece about how uh, by, in that case, a bilingual piece moves from one language to the other and in the process transforming the meaning of both languages and, and what, is, uh, um, what is being or trying to be said and multiplies the semantics and multiplies what it could mean. Um, so absolutely, I think the New Yorkian movement and context are routinely overlooked. Uh, I think we're maybe the only people that have ever made that connection uh, in scholarship. Uh, but I also want to say that when I say uh, what I think he means, the art came from her, it certainly involves her mother and it certainly might involve the fact that she had some kind of artistic aspirations. She was certainly interested in art um, and, uh, and took the, the time and invested energy in Basquiat, in shaping Basquiat's early repertoire of what he saw as art and what context and what he produced. I mean, there's some anecdotes about uh, her not being that that happy that he was drawing cartoons, you know, and, and having higher aspirations for his creative output. But I also think the RK from her uh, addresses the larger uh, maternal side of the family, which was an artistic family, uh, musically. So uh, although he didn't uh, become, although he had a, a musical outlet, he had a band, uh, he didn't prioritize that eventually. Uh, I would say that um, his maternal side nurture and the idea that artists uh, um, are, were important and that art forms were important and that they had a link to the Caribbean and to the African diaspora, not only as viewed from the US, but from the Caribbean as well, is, uh, is part of the story. 
I'm gonna look in the chat. I think that's my my job, you know, one of the jobs really is. Um, I think that, oh, we have a lot of, um, Okay, I saw other things in the chat. I see, I see. Oh, oh, questions and answers. I'm looking in the wrong thing. Ah, great. Francis, will you will you address the mental health subject associated with Matilda and Basquiat? Are you going to expand on it or deconstruct it? I am curious whether or not attributing mental illness to Matilda is, is a way to demonize her son. Hmm. I think this is one of the most difficult areas in my research at the moment, uh, because it's very, very difficult to reach uh, this question uh, at all at all levels in terms of access to any kind of documentation, in terms of uh, how family will or will not speak about this. Uh, but I do think that however people are understand, the ones that uh, have some access to information that overlaps to some extent with the gist of your question, uh, those people generally uh, don't want to talk about it. Uh, so there is obviously something that has, there is an issue around quote unquote mental illness uh, in the family and might be, I mean, you can, one hypothesis could be, it might be one of the reasons that uh, Matilda Basquiat gets underscored, it doesn't get, uh, doesn't get underscored in the, uh, in the narratives. Uh, what the relationship between that and Basquiat um, is an interesting question, and uh, and I am working on it. Um, certainly, Basquiat has not been uh, has been not uh, generally people don't call him mentally ill. They 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 use uh, other types of rubrics like a uh, drug addict, uh, other types of of things, um, but. I guess the short answer to that, it is very difficult to research it. I am I am researching it at the moment. And uh, I, when I have a conclusion, I will let you know. Yes, I mean, some people could, uh, I'm looking at the chat, some people would catalog drug addiction as a mental illness, but some people would not. I mean, this is all, the, these categories are very complex uh, and have all kinds of repercussions and we need to contextualize and just figure out what we mean by them when we use them and what effects and uh, impact they have when we do in different contexts. Mm -hmm. Well, I mean, I think one of the questions or what I would, what I would do with Matilda, Ma Matilde is, um, Ma Matilde, right? Matilde? Matilde, the family Matilde. we call her, yeah. We don't, I mean, do we really have to, if you can't research a subject's, particular subject's life, I think that can't we make something of her absence as representative of, the, of a larger absence of women of color um, in the narrative? I mean, certainly, I mean, I of think- Of our history, you know, of our history, you know, particularly Afro-Borico women. And that's how we can get back to this issue of race. I think in a productive way is to really consider um, that these were women, these were women of color, Afro-Borico women with, with artistic aspirations that could not be, you know, that the island itself would not, would not be host to either. You know, it wasn't as though the island would be a refuge for them to like experience the art world there. That was a very male dominated scene on the island, right? Yeah. And, and then you come here and, and um, it's white supremacist and male dominated. Um, and, it was, and Puerto Rico class is a very big issue. Um, so, um, you know, I see them both as kind of, coming here at the time just before this movement eclipse, you know, begins to emerge in which as women with children, they're not being able to be part of either. And I think certainly, I, I don't think the question is, is whether someone was mentally ill or not, but to me, it's really to uh, be able to tell these stories in their complexity and in their richness. Um, <laughs> And, and in the case, which is the case in all research, uh, all investigations, that there's a lot that we actually never are able to fully understand. Uh, however, we can hypothesize, we can imagine, we can uh, share 
uh, we can engage uh, with what is suggested. And I think that's more the exercise that, that, I'm, that I'm engaged in with this piece that I'm working on now. Um, on, the, on the question of class, it's, it's interesting because the Andrade's um, side um, has some affluence. Uh, uh, for instance, Flora, uh, Matilde's, um, le relatively speaking, um, Matilde's mother, Flora, had some means. She, she uh, owned a school in Puerto Rico. Um, and um, so this family is, is a, a very complex family too at the level of, of class and race. And of course, on Gerard's side, uh, there is um, affluence as well. And that's much more documented in the catalog, the specifics of uh, their social class positioning. Uh, but to the question of uh, artistic aspirations uh, and the, the art histor historical narrative, one of the things, one of the reasons I embarked on this um, project is because when you read what most people have written about the uh, influences on uh, artistic influences on Basquiat, uh, things like uh, the writing or, or references, uh, the, the things that they didn't have a frame for, which usually were Puerto Rican, Latin American, et cetera, were overlooked. Uh, and the lineage was, it, it, it was male and Western. So exactly. part of what this question of the art came from her, what could that mean, is very broad. It's not only about Matilde, it's about a whole constellation of contexts that are routinely overlooked in trying to make sense of uh, what Basquiat produced. Yes, I, I, um, I'm in full agreement with that. So what was what would you say was your favorite part of the show and your you know like what 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 did you come away with the show i mean i think the the things i highlighted were among my favorite i think the the uh that the fact that there was a lot of early material where you could see the importance of uh, different resource uh, source material writing mass media which is another interest of mine uh, so I think the, 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 the timeline of it uh, was one of the uh, major contributions. The fact that uh, most shows of Basquiat begin when he became a, a professional or became, uh, was on, on the cusp of becoming famous, while this show's timeline uh, extended much farther back. Uh, and this uh, gave you the opportunity to uh, discover moments of emergence. Uh, another dimension of the show that's uh, not present in most other shows is uh, Basquiat the Collector. And, and I highlighted the collector, uh, the, the books, because they're important to what I look at when I look at Basquiat. But uh, he collected other things. Uh, he collected African masks, he collected uh, other uh, a black artists, uh, other artists. And uh, so in that sense, uh, it gave you a sense of source materials and his engagement with multiple dimensions of other things. Uh, that is not typically present when you just show discrete works. So you show painting after painting after painting, that's kind of one, it, 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 it uh, proposes a certain type of relationship. But in this exhibit, you have spaces, recreated spaces, you have collections, uh, you have uh, works, uh, you have objects like his bicycle. Uh, so it, it actually provides many more uh, points of relation uh, than in a typical show. I think that was those two things, the timeline and the presence of multiple uh, objects that facilitate more connections between things was probably my favorite, my favorite two things. Yeah. You know, I, I wanted to, um, before, um, if anyone has a question, please put it on there. But I, I just, I wanted to end with, um, you know, just a consideration of what, of what this means to me as a person who, you know, basically is in an academic, art world, takes an academic art world perspective, you know, what does this exhibition mean to me? Initially, I was kind of unsettled by it because I thought it was very Smithsonian-like and a little folkloric and, you know, but that's because I wasn't even imagining what it really is, is aspiring to be, which is, you know, a permanent institution like, like, uh, dedicated to an artist. Like if you go to Monet's house in Paris, you know, you get some of that too. So I was thinking really small. And when I started to think internationally about how great artists are recognized and how, you know, and what their family does to preserve their legacy. So, you know, I mean, this is right now when it's an exhibition, maybe, I don't know what the family is, is, uh, is uh, thinking about, 
Maybe one day it will be a permanent sort of institution. But right now, instead of instead of thinking of it, uh, you know, my initial reaction, I think I, I was I was not really comparing it to what I think it it can be compared to, which is, you know, the house of a of a of a famous artist in, in the League of Picasso and Manet and and and, and Matisse um, and Wilfredo Lam. So but, we, but you, the thing is that those two things can coexist, right? It could yes, be, they can. You know, can. Uh, Frida Kahlo. I mean, who goes to Mexico and doesn't visit the house of Frida Kahlo? The right. same could on be the one hand, uh, you know, it does reference the Smithsonian and it does reference those other commodified uh, institutional spaces. On the other hand, uh, it also provides opportunities to um, make relation, uh, you know, make new relations between things. So I, I, that's the, the the it's not an either or. It's that the reality is that those spaces are complex, ambiguous, contradictory, and intention often in in, in multiple ways. Uh, and uh, you know, it's not either good or bad, really. No, it's not good or bad. But I was I was thinking about it in, in one way, and then I started to really say to myself, why am I having this reaction, you know? And yet I'm I'm perfectly I'm delighted to go to Manet's house. And it's like, girl, or 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 rummage through um uh Jackson Pollock's uh studio, which I go every year if I'm in the Hamptons, I drop by that 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 studio. And um I just I just uh, look forward uh, to it continuing in some way, perhaps like a permanent monument to, to Jean-Michel at some point and uh, encourage people to see it with a critical eye. Um, um, also, I'm not getting paid by the, by the, by the family, by the way. I, I definitely I have my own Jean-Michel. <laughs> uh, I definitely agree people should go see this show and read the catalog if you're so in inclined. I also would say that there's another, uh, actually the, the other show closed, right? Jasmine? Yes. The other show closed. Actually, the other show closed because it was a fascinating show, uh, which uh, controlled the variable of surface, basically. So it was about uh, the ways that Jean Michel Basquiat uh, painted um, uh, or, or created works on multiple types of materials, not not canvas, uh, and and just controlling for that variable gave you a, an entire different view of the relationship between Basquiat and what they call objecthood. Right. Uh, you know, so there will be a catalog uh, coming up. Uh, I also don't work for them, uh, but there is uh, uh, some writing coming out of that show. Uh, for those interested, I would recommend uh, looking that up. Absolutely, it's it's it was a fantastic exhibition, and if we had more time, we I would have shown you that one as well. Um, but um, you you can catch some of it on the web. So uh, we're told that we've got two minutes left. So um, any parting thoughts, Francis? Um, uh, parting thoughts. Well, I, I feel like this this was definitely uh, um, doing something different, uh, and in that sense, I feel it very much um, will influence what I'm going to do from then on. And rate, even if they didn't um, discuss, like for instance, the question of, of race or in, in uh, um, Afro Latino or uh, Latino context, they didn't go there. Just by raising the 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 question, I think they contributed to expanding our dialogue. Uh, so I just look forward to more people uh, talking about this and sharing your perspectives. Okay, thanks. I hope that we get to see each other at some point. It's been a long time since COVID that I've actually interacted much with my dear friend and colleague, Francis. Um, <laughs> all right, all right. Bueno, buenas tardes. Thank you all for attending. Um, and uh, feel free to, uh, if, if you need us to address anything more, please write to the Centro um, and they'll send it um, to our emails and I'll, I'll be happy to, and I'm sure Francis will be too, to address um, further issues in uh, via via email. Okay, buenas tardes a todo el mundo. Buenas tardes, gracias. muchas gracias.